Um, and you're also able to um, send in uh, questions just at the end of the webinar. Um, so um, with that, I think I'm just going to turn things over to one of our MFA students, Makesha Tolbert, who's going to give uh, Kyle a more formal introduction. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Makesha Linnea Tolbert, and I'm a first year MFA candidate in the University of Virginia's creative writing program. What a gift to introduce Kyle Dargan as this fall's Ray visiting writer in poetry, and how humbling to welcome Kyle back to grounds that he knows well here at the University of Virginia. The UVA Ray, writing series, Ray Visiting Writer Series is made possible through the generosity of the Dungannon Foundation. And during their time with us, each Ray Visiting Writer gives a public reading of their work and then conducts intensive one-on-one -on -one manuscript consultations with MFA students. This fall, our programming will take place virtually and our plans are to be in person in spring 2022. Kyle Dargan is the author of five collections of poetry, the most recent titled Anagnoresis, which won a 2019 Academy of American Poets Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize and was long listed for the 2019 Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. Dargan is also the author of Honest Engine, Lageria Dementia, Bouquet of Hungers, and The Listening. Dargan's debut collection, The Listening, won the 2003 Cave Canem Poetry Prize. And a few of his additional awards include the 2008 Hurston Wright Legacy Award for Poetry, as well as support and recognition from the DC Commission on the Arts and Humanities. In Anagnoresis, the poems are electric with the alchemy of self-recognition. We encounter the heroes embedded into each of us uncovering what we stand for at the pace of what we have lived through. Quote, every wince another chapter, every chapter titled, it is hard to be a living thing. To be born human is to be tendered this challenge to live larger than your world, unquote. In a recess, we surrender to our multitudes. We challenge the true and the untrue. We try to make sense of that which refuses to excise itself out of the collective imagination. And when the hero is exhausted or has no country to stand on, there might be more safety in being a stranger, even if only for a minute. In Dargan's section titled China Cycle, I think of James Baldwin's essay, Stranger in the Village, in Baldwin's recurring encounters as a perpetual stranger, but for still while writing in Switzerland than might have been here. So Dargan's work troubles the terrain across which we live and die, and we are left wondering who exactly is at the center of this Greek tragedy. And at the end of Anagnoresis, my mind goes to the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose writing spoke to what it is to be, quote, creatively maladjusted, unquote, and, quote, joyfully unresolved, unquote. In Anagnoresis, Dargan's sense of joy lingers in me. In his words, quote, that's how close I'll hug my candles, my joy a refuge from a country at times so cold, my hands don't feel the flame searing, unquote. Kyle Dargan is currently an associate professor of literature at American University and assistant director of American University's creative writing program. He is the founder and editor of Post No Ills magazine and is currently managing editor at Wonderland, Janelle Monet's creative company. As an educator, Dargan has spent years working with young writers through the Writopia Lab, the Young Writers Workshop, and 826 DC. Additionally, Dargan has been a collaborator with the President's Committee on the Arts and Humanities at the White House and at the Library of Congress. Please join me, however muted and unmuted, in welcoming Kyle Dargan back to the University of Virginia as this year's Ray Visiting Writer in Poetry. Oh, <clears throat> Makesha, thank you so much uh, for that, that generous reading, reading of my own work. 
um, and also just uh, the other voices in you know lines of thought that you connected to it. Um, that phrase, I think it was um, creatively maladjusted. Um, I think that actually might be um, a, a good title uh, for this whole um, reading tonight. Uh, given the work I'm going to share um, is mostly new stuff. I think I saw the reading advertised somewhere and um, I think it, it suggested I was, I was going to read new work. And I was like, I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember agreeing to that. But then and, oh, as I as the time approached, I was like, yeah, you know, maybe I'll just do it um, anyway. So I think that's going to happen. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of that work is going to reflect um, the chaos uh, that we, we've all been through. Um, over the last couple of years. Um, and before I get started to, you know, I'd just like to thank um, Jeb Living Good so much for, for all his work in um, organizing this event. Um, and just to like all he he taught me in my time um, at UVA as an undergrad. And of course, Lisa Raspar and Kiki Fetrosino um, and Rita and Deborah and, you know, all, all these people. I mean, that's why I don't think I could ever have, you know, too much of a, a, a bad thought about, you know, Charlottesville, um, just given so much that it has sort of fed me and, and supported me and continue um, to feed, to feed, can use the feed and support me um, over my creative life. Um, so I'm just so, so thankful to be back. Um, for me, and I imagine for lots of other people, um, the pandemic was kind of like the, the worst professional phase of my life. Um, I was teaching a new class for the first time, our students um, sort of thesis class uh, from the undergraduates. And, you know, I remember telling my workshop students at the beginning of the semester, like, you know, watch this, um, you know, coronavirus thing. And I remember a couple of them sort of like chuckling and then, you know, when everything shut down and just having to sort of, as many of you had to do reinvent the wheel in a moment, like, what do we do? Um, to sort of like continue some semblance of, you know, what, you know, these students were um, engaged in, uh, which was really, really hard, but also knowing that it just wasn't going to be the same and graduating students out into that world, it just felt terrible, no matter how much we tried to sort of approximate some kind of normalcy. Um, and so, you know, that, that bad taste sort of carrying forward, you know, the exhaustion of it. Um, but like, the strange thing is, like, I don't, like it, it's not really as though I, I remember most of the pandemic that way, um, in part because like, I think I also kind of, you know, found out or sort of discovered that I was still a romantic um, during the pandemic um, and also sort of had that, that taken away from me. Um, and, you know, I was pretty solid uh, throughout, throughout most of this. And I think now, you know, when I talk to, friends and other people I know, you know, my fear, you know, with this sort of Delta fall is like, you know, now's the time, you know, when I think you have to worry about the strong people, because, um, you know, many of them been sort of holding up quietly, you know, for almost two years. And I think now you really need to watch and make sure that, you know, they're not the ones that fall off, you know, and I have to think about myself on that way sometime, because, you know, my, my biggest goal for the whole pandemic was to make sure that my daughter, um, who was three and four sort of through it, um, didn't remember or won't remember any of this um, at all. I mean, sort of in the same way that I don't remember the Reagan administration, like that was the goal. Like I don't want my daughter to, to remember um, this. So I've been trying to sort of like do this dance of normalcy uh, for her, which is, you know, also kind of taking its toll uh, on me and I'm sure many other sort of parents um, and, you know, my blessings to everyone, but, you know, particularly, you know, parents too have been guiding little people who don't quite understand what's going on through uh, what we've been through. Um, so anyway, I just say that to kind of uh, uh, inform some of the strangest or, or whatever sort of comes out of this work. Um, I'm gonna read some new sort of unassociated stuff um, and also something from a, an ongoing project that I think I've been writing for about maybe eight years. Um, and I know I talked about projects a bit you know, with the uh, MFA student cohort and like kind of how you handle multiple projects. Uh, letting new work be what it is and also continuing to so this is something i've been working on for for eight years and you know not not because i've been slacking on it i've been writing but it's a it's a book on um or sort of looking at the world through sort of like examining masculinity through my own experiences 
And um, I know someone might say like, oh, all, all your writing is about that. But I mean, like in a, in a subconscious way, yes, but like to consciously do it um, for an entire book. Um, so I'm going to, you know, read from uh, some of that too, and also some new work. Um, and I want to try to share my screen because I think I, I find that, you know, people engage with poetry in different ways. Some people are listeners. Uh, some people need to see the text. So whenever I have the opportunity, I try to make sure that um, both are available. So I'm going to try to share my screen. So hopefully that will work. Um, so one rule I sort of developed for myself during the pandemic, kind of as a survival mechanism and to sort of keep my creativity going, was that if, you know, there's anything I found absolutely hilarious on the internet, um, I would try to write something about it. Um, just as a way of like capturing, uh, you know, some kind of joy. So just like one little thing, this isn't the original TikTok, I guess, but this is sort of the, the funniest um, adaptation uh, to me. And I got to remember to click share sound because that is something I often do not do when I am, am teaching. Um, computer audio, yes, so. Um, TikTok. Um. Excuse me, sir. <clears throat> Excuse me. Do you have time to talk about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Hey, don't run from the Lord. Okay. So, um, you know, this that. I think the original one was like with a deer, um, but I like the one with the dog better because uh, it's it's funnier. So, you know, just that that phrase, you know, don't run from the Lord. I just kind of wrote that down uh, one day, and I decided, okay, like. You're just gonna uh, go with it for the sake of of keeping that um, energy. So, actually, no, I didn't want to do it this way. I wanted to try to um, do both at the same time because I am a power user. Um, here we go. Good. Now, I think if I share screen, I can share both. Uh, I don't want that, but I do want this. So, okay. Anyway, you see a little bit of me. Um, here we go. I've seen God chase down a comet, not even breathing hard, not even breathing, because what is breath to God? What do you know about that life? about speed beyond respiratory systems and lactic acid, about a body that might as well be a blink, how a hummingbird could feel like a land seal lumbering, trying to pivot and dodge God's call. The universe, imagine this is why it continues expanding, wide stretches, it in chase of the voice of God. Your galaxy has been getting smoked, dusted, all that stuff floating around in the dark heat void. That's the universe going catabolic, fissuring in the non-existent hope of rotating a pace. So who are you to run, human? It is not enough for me to call you snail, call you stalactite. Computers boosted your search speed, but to God, you are slower than an adult processor. Every internet tab, open on the hunt for a shortcut or a way away, you should close some windows, save yourself, drop the thread, little Theseus, and give it, it, you, up to God, to God, who had to send someone as stone-footed, as mud-tongued as me, to politely now ask you not bother hoofing and huffing that you wade your ears into this wake of God exhaust. That crackling is not static. This whole time you have been within the blaze you thought you were outrunning. And it's always funny like reading new poems because you can, uh, you, you read the old stuff. So like right here, you know, when that, that the was a that, and it might go back to a that. Um, so yeah, that's the, uh, first poem. Um, this poem is it done? I don't think it's done. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, read it now. Um, 
there might be more. I think there is more to it, but also I don't know. I like the idea of where it, it kind of ended. Um, and I, I'll say, you know, one thing about this poem, you know, my mother has become an at-home caregiver for my uh, stepfather who had a stroke and a, a number of uh, subsequent issues that have, that have sort of rendered him uh, invalid. And of course, like no one signs up for that. Um, but, you know, once it happens, like you, you know, you have the choice to, you know, do what, do what you can. And, um, you know, for my mother, that's in some ways a particularly tragic um, ending to that marriage, not only because, of course, my, my stepfather's ill, but also because, you know, she grew up in the projects, sort of the oldest of about, you know, uh, nine or 10 brothers and sisters. So, you know, you can look at her whole life as this kind of arc of being um, an unchosen sort of like caregiver, right? Um, and in some ways, it's sort of really strange thing. I mean, of course, with the pandemic, like I, I don't want to try to go be in their space too much um, because, you know, you don't want to sort of introduce um, any uh, germs and uh, contaminants. Um, so in a way, like I feel like I've lost, I lost my mother in part to the pandemic um, and to my stepfather's illness just because of the sort of the, the degree of alienation. Um, and even, you know, sometimes those things reach a point where even if you try to reach out, uh, say like through the phone or some other means, um, you could just tell it's not sufficient. And like both parties are aware that it's not sufficient and not sure if there's anything that could be done to kind of make up for that deficit. Um, so anyway, that's sort of what this fragment um, is coming out of. I fear asking my mother about joy. Middle voice to I, marker between the terminals of two men, father who left her, stepfather whose widowing she awaits, whose illness she begged, he warred instead of welcome. I bear their intonations. I bear their postures, gates. Dare I approach my mother and ask where she finds her joy or merely how she names it? Would I be asking about the fish in a non-existent sea of her unsailed time? Um, right, so uh, during the pandemic, um, I had to do like all this extra driving because I'm, you know, I'm in DC, I'm a, I'm a car person. Um, I mean, not car person, I'm a Metro person. Like I, I like getting around on the Metro and, um, you know, you know, getting my daughter around, sort of picking her up. She was fortunate enough to be in school, but, you know, that was really inconsistent, you know, with, you know, COVID uh, breakdowns and, and everything. So, um, you know, one day I was like out in Annapolis, you know, my father had come down to visit me, which is like the first time in, you know, almost a year and a half, you know, in my old car, um, you know, something that I knew was wrong and just didn't uh, ever address what seemed to be like the one thing, like the pandemic, the pandemic was like, all right, that thing that you haven't been addressing, like now's the time because it's either going to break or like you're not going to get a break from it. So, you know, the car just died um, sort of out towards Annapolis. And I was like, you know, this thing's not safe. I have to get a new car. Um, and I'm very much anti-car note, first car note in my life. So like stressful. Um, so the new car, right? Um, and if like if you had a car that's like 20 years old, or at least like my car is 18 years old, you had a, a car that 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 old, and you get a new car now, it's like walking into a spaceship. Like you you get into a new car, and it's like there are features like my car will like move me back into a lane. Like if I drift, or like don't use the turn signal, like it's crazy. Um, but anyway, so the new car has serious radio in it, um, and I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I'll use it because it's there. Um, and of course, like I turned to Comedy Central because I'm like, you know, I listen to NPR all the time. The only thing I would listen to other is, you know, Comedy Central. So I listen to a lot of Comedy Central, you know, in the car, you know, which is good, except like one of the things I noticed is that, um, and at first I thought it was bad curation, right? I felt like, oh, they're picking bad stuff. Um, but like a lot of the, uh, you know, the, the male comedians sort of like, it's kind of like, you know, dick, poop, fart humor like in a way that you don't realize until like you listen to like you know half an hour of it and you're like hmm, like 70 percent of that was like dick poop fart humor and you're just like okay like apparently you know um because I I went to all boys school so I guess I should know this too but I've also kind of like moved away from those spaces once I got out of like 
uh, high school. Like, I don't want to be in all all male spaces anymore. So maybe I just forgot. Um, but I'm like, huh, like this sort of a obsession, you know, particularly with, um, you know, the penis. And so like after that, this is so this is all just warm up for what this poem is about. So like fair warning, like if you want to check. So anyway, um, you know, thinking about this and I've, I've had this kind of like another feeling and I was talking about this with a friend, how sometimes like you live in D.C. and like you think about like the project of the last four years and how part of it was kind of like to make it feel like so strange or surreal that Obama was ever president at all. Like, you know, there be every time you sort of like, was I dreaming? Like, was a, was a black guy like really president or like, you know, did that happen? Or like, is it crazy? Um, and, and, you know, of course, like part of that is, yeah, there, there was a black guy president. That's why, you know, what happened afterwards happened. Um, but so anyway, just thinking about the resentment around that, um, I'm talking a lot because clearly I'm anxious about this poem, but I, I promised myself I was going to read it anyway, so I'm going to read it. Um, and it's sort of this in a new pandemic poem, right? Uh, so it's called Rearview Freestyle because, you know, Kendrick uh, Lamar has that song, Backseat Freestyle, you know, uh, which is, you know, I pray my dick gets big as the Eiffel Tower, so blah, 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 blah. Uh, so, yeah, this poem is uh, called Rearview Freestyle. And it, it takes some of that uh, same energy, except it's um, about Obama um, in ways. So uh, anyway, yeah, Rearview Freestyle. <clears throat> a small part of me hopes that Obama has a really big dick. I'm not talking about energy. Matter is what I mean, mass and space and the reality same as ours. That part of me wants it so big, it explains those pauses when he speeches. It's weight pulling down on his diaphragm, denying the necessary air for the next rhetorical flourish. So big that if you were, say, an unhung senator with a demographically outsized vote, and you just happened to have peeped it one day in the Senate locker room, you would never speak of it again. The mere ekphrastic utterance would shrivel you an existential shrinkage before God. Speaking of which, I have prayed, dear God, I hope Obama's dick grows a cubic micron every time America calls him a nigger. I hope that would have been reason number 403 First Lady Michelle Obama could have opted out of the second term, that she grown tired of dealing with him and his Mr. President. But Obama cares, yes? Was that not a whole counter messaging campaign? He wouldn't cause her pain. I remember once being able to tell that I was hurting a lover, her wince and suck of air at the end of each stroke. I remember asking and her replying, no, well, it's a good pain. And my having no idea what that meant, but imagining her answer, as the answer I like to give when people ask me, do I ever regret being an American? Anyway, wouldn't you feel better about being chided to be a better black parent by a POTUS armed with daddy dick? Doesn't it sting less getting sunned by a predator's hellfire strike if the commanding chief deals in big dick, like big enough to maybe blame the dick? Like apologies, I came to liberate you, but the dick complicates things sometimes. Obstruction is one of my favorite feelings. The mornings I wake and rumble around the kitchen, all the things my dick accidentally knocks against. The swung refrigerator door, the twirling bar stool, the phantom hand of the hanging oven mitt. I want that feeling for Obama, just exponential. That stainless steel fridge door, instead the amalgamated metal of all the guns that ache to undo him and the America they feared he anticipated that brushing his side every morning and every day a thousand mornings or more. Can you imagine the density of the dick you would need to walk straight through all of that, still doing the job of heading America's political chimera? Am I still talking matter? Maybe I'm talking energy now because the type of dick I'm describing would be more prohibitive to a modest life, a modest mind than even the presidency. But that is what I want this land to be forced to accommodate, a mass of joy-giving, life-giving, Black flesh as big 
so they can actually see it as the one this land imagines, as big as the one uh, this land has punished us for, swinging rent-free in its mind. I was messing with the ending of that poem too, which you can sort of see. Um, there is some of that there. All right. Um, so the switch kinda, although maybe it won't feel like much of a switch uh, to the, the masculinity stuff. Um, so the, the book's title, and I, I can just you know show it for a second if I can uh, switch uh, documents here. So the, the book's title um, that I kind of just put together on my own, like I didn't know it was a thing because I have this uh, bad habit of messing around in languages that I don't actually speak. Um, so the, the book's title, um, Panzer Hers, which is, um, I guess you could say um, German, you know, for armored, armored heart or sort of tank, tank heart, armored heart. Um, when I, when I put that together for the book, you know, um, and, 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 and in a way, like the term describes, you know, you know, I had a, you know, after, after like my, my moment of significant heartbreak during the pandemic, you know, I was reaching out to my, my father a lot. And really this is probably the closest I've been to my father in my whole life. And, you know, he admitted to me something that I thought, um, I just never, you know, never had the nerve or never expected him to articulate it. Um, that he sort of told me that around his 30s, like, you know, after, after he left my mother, and I think like maybe two relationships after that, I remember, um, you know, there was a woman that he loved, um, and she sort of moved away uh, from New Jersey, um, that he told me he sort of like walled off his heart, right? You know, he, he admitted that. And, you know, that process of like walling off the heart, I think, um, speaks to so much of, you know, people often talk about the um, the lack of sort of emotional development um, in men, and I think you know, and, and particularly sort of, of course, like cis uh, straight uh, hetero men, and um, I think part of part of that walling off, right? Um, so much of that is like related to you know insecurity. Part of it related to um, the you know the unrequited, but I think that's also the fear of the of something not being requited. And, um, you know, that, that sense of like, how do we get into this thing, you know, this heart um, that so many men often armor up to the extent that they become impenetrable, not only by others, but like also in, impenetrable um, for themselves, right? So that was just sort of the organizing idea for the manuscript. But then, you know, when I submitted it, you know, to the, my, uh, my publisher, um, the reviewer that they had read it pointed out to me that it's actual, actually a, a physical condition, right? Um, that the sac around the heart, uh, the pericardium, um, can actually become sort of hard and constrictive to the point that it, you know, limits the heart's function um, and actually sort of needs to be removed, right? And that's like not the kind of thing that you can like tell a poet and then like them not need to sort of like rearrange the whole manuscript to get that in there, right? So now like the, the manuscript has kind of been in the state where it's in for about a year, but you know, I'm writing um, these other poems now uh, about sort of like the, the pericardium, sort of like this, this sac around the heart. Um, and I think those are gonna be like the, um, the, the, the post throughout the manuscript. Um, as it evolves. It was already sort of evolved around kind of like the four stages of the heart pumping blood. Um, but I think this thing with the, 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 the pericardium is, is much more interesting. Um, so, I mean, these, these are like really new. Um, I think they're gonna work in pairs. So like one, one, like the first one is always gonna be more so about the heart. Um, and the second one is, you know, always gonna be kind of more about uh, specifically um, thinking about in masculinity. Um, so this is just the, the first pair, and it, they may even appear differently um, in the book. Um, so um, pericardiectomy, like that's that procedure where, you know, the, the pericardium is like cut and sort of removed from around the heart. For how within us it lives, the heart travels modestly, 
the pericardium no more ornate than a canvas bladder, its single traveler's suit, uh, which it, the heart, grows to fit snugly over a season's time. It is said of brilliant people, same attire every day. A brilliant motor, the heart. When we say have a heart, maybe we mean be brilliant in your compassion. What empathetic genius it must take knowing all the heart knows about us and still finding reasons we might be worthy of another beat and another. That enormity, the blood tint rosing our fates looking glass, all of that clad and strapped within the humble fibrous pericardium as if the body understanding its treasure said to the heart, wear this and high. The next part. Supposition. Manhood is just a sack. Or that cis seeing men relate to it as such. Something to be filled. Something not worth adorning since it comes empty. Plausible. The desire to penetrate others is a vicarious and frightening desire to be filled. How tough a never stretched sack can become. How hard. At some point sooner in a self-perceived sack's life than it might think, it becomes a carapace, the emptiness. There is no way it may be touched without first cracking the armor that it has become. Um, so that's kind of cool because the armor thing leads into what is now the first poem um, in the current manuscript. Didn't plan that, love that when that kind of happens. So I'll jump to the actual book. Um, and this is the first, the first poem. I actually wrote this or wrote it after I was in Ireland um, visiting a friend that I met in China and, um, you know, he took me like, you know, back to his, his village, you know, where he's from and um, looking at like some of the old castles um, and just thinking about like what, like what was going through one's mind, like what, what, what had to be up with you um, to like build this kind of structure, kind of like you look at it like, hmm, it, it's kind of like you can say, um, you know, a manifestation of some kind of insecurity. But anyway, um, it's called King for a Day. Seize a foothill from the ridges peering godly from the north. Break them. Actually, let me let me go back and try to share the whole screen because I, I don't want it to be just uh, text because like that's like PowerPoint boring. Um, King for a day. Seize a foothill from the ridges peering godly from the north. Break them. Let chisel and sledge reduce them to torso and skull-sized chunks. Raise earth into a mot. Set your inner castle stones. Erect around that. Keep 12 defensive towers and adjoining curtain walls. Above the battlements, set on pikes, flown like flags, the hands and feet of your enemies. You will still need a proper flag, something to hang as pennant, emblazoned with the family crest you bear. And by you, what is embodied is the royal we, the serfs and knights and smiths who bejewel your crown, and your crown being nothing more than your one skull. And yet a head you believe so precious whole geologies had to be reformed around it. O oh, patchwork mountain, O oh, cold abode of rock, what little defense this will afford you when comes tomorrow the age of cannons. Um, and the next piece 
Um, I'm going to read, whoa, time is flying. I guess I'll only read a couple more. Uh, I know you're reading, some of you are reading Lee Young Lee right now. Um, Rose, you know, one of, um, one of my favorite books. And uh, so, so this poem, the title comes from, um, you know, one of the, uh, one of my favorite poems in that book, Eating Alone. And um, I had not you know, think about this. This might be a little more emotional than I uh, planned for, but we'll get through it. Um, what more could I, a young man, want? Arriving home after my daily expiration point, I cannot bring myself to settle my house into proper repose. I stumble into slumber, leaving bulbs to emanate all night, a burning within the nest. Set then unattended, the senile dishwasher churns into the new day. I awaken at some odd hour, maybe four. Shallow sleep bleached by fluorescence. The air tinny with the rumpus of water steady pelt against a mixing bowl. This house's restlessness is my own. The wood, the copper, the brick, all remember what they once were. Pine tree, palisades, shale, my God. How did I come to preside over this shrine to diminution? What life do I abandon when I rise as a working man in toil for this privilege of living alone? Um, I did want to get one angry poem in. Uh, I don't think I will find it. I really don't know my way around this this book just yet because I don't of course like the poems aren't even where they're gonna eventually be uh so forgive this little bit of uh scrolling um but this poem I wasn't sure, sure this was actually going to make it into the book um but um uh, after I thought about it and after the pandemic I was like I don't care um it's going in the book uh so this title is, um, I Scream My Throat Raw. I scream my throat raw into the sky between the new high rises, plumb like glass tombstones above the city I knew, into the guest room whose only guest has become my screaming, into the washing machine's drum, into the mirror, into the eyes of the fool, there, always wearing the same stains. Into the particulate rich air, I want to tremble with someone else's voice, not mine. Into the temporary existence where I am all throat, something akin to a star, a fury of hydrogen and helium that will be heard far after I have extinguished. Into the theoretical box of time, there is no echo, as the walls have not proved finished. Into my own head, fists over my mouth, there was always an echo, a congregation of all the screams I don't scream at you, 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 but I should. It has to be healthier than this, my own rage growing viral inside me. Um, 41, sorry, one more, what to read. Um, I mean, I'll read this poem about my dad, um, who, um, he almost, he almost died in a weird way, um, and I wasn't around, um, and, you know, by chance he made it out, and, um, you know, I think that's just, you know, one of the things you always find yourself preparing for in some way, um, the loss of your parents. And it just, this would have been one that I couldn't have been ready for. Um, but I'll, I'll read here and, and stop. I'll say, you know, I love to answer questions. So if you have them about anything, I say, I said, social security number, like happy to do it. Um, you know, thank you all for, for listening so far. And I hope we can, we can chat a little bit. Um, and so this, this last poem is for the man um, who caught my father. Bam. 
Here we go. <sighs> Maybe a little kombucha before I. For the man who caught my father when he lilted, lost and fainting, and careened off the bar stool. Dear catcher, dear hands, I pray you know this is not just another tale about a dad and liquor. You know something about my father, even I do not, his weight and plummet and the necessary force to keep his shoulders from plowing into the floor or his temple from tasting the chrome leg of the bar stool beside him. As it stands, this is a tale of a man with bones well trod by tobacco and hard spirits. I have been a character in this story you have now saved. Yes. I am the one who crawled free from ash swells, who was not whiskey drowned, who would leave home to alight from trains and towns where none knew his damp cigarette singed skin. Kissing the phone screen against my cheek, I tried to deduce the cause of father's fall. A doctor, one month prior, what I know which you do not, snaked the balloon through my father's arteries so hard they collapsed a stent left for scaffolding in the unstable blood shaft. I fathom he maybe lowered himself awkwardly upon the seat with his thigh spilling over the edge, the mesh holding his periphery artery open to blood instead pinched narrow. What the doctor feared when he ordered no more racquetball. Couldn't that drive a man to seek a pity drink, to grab a seat at the bar, ergonomics be damned and his blood pressure sinking. You held my father until the ambulance carried him to the hospital that let him go, tests cleared. And I can only ponder any of that. I can only write this now at a distance at ease because you, dear arms, snapped open that human preservation reflex and embraced his payload, which had it crashed would have made a crypt of me. Um, thank you. Hey, Kyle, I'm just coming back on the screen. So um, if anyone wants to send any questions, you're certainly welcome to through the Q&A, but um, I just wanted to thank you in advance for uh, this virtual trip, at least back to back to UVA. Um, I, you know, I was thinking about in some of the ways that UVA has changed since um, when, when you were a student. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that, that is, going on, is going on now or that I see is for one of the first times, the, um, the, you write a lot about masculinity. And I was just thinking of um, looking at the numbers at UVA of men and women. And we're in the time when UV, that UVA is now um, dominantly women for the, and, and repeatedly so for one of the first times. Um, and so I just wonder if, and, and I, this isn't just a UVA, this is across the board at almost every university that's out there, fewer and fewer men deciding to go to college. And I just wonder if that, um, that change uh, influences your work at all, or just if, if you would, I don't know, it, it influences when you're teaching or anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it might be fewer men deciding it, it also might be, you know, just more women earning spaces, you know, sure. like it's, it's the funny thing, like I was, I was reading, like, I've, I've been watching this whole like Taliban uh, story this closely, because, you know, these guys claiming some something is about religion when it's not like, it's about, you know, male insecurity. And there was this thing that they like two weeks ago, they were saying, like, you know, if 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 your job if your job can't be done uh, by a man, then like you can stay in your job, but otherwise like you need to stay home. And I'm like, you 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 all don't really understand <laughs> how many of your jobs could be done by a woman. Like that's that's the way you're you're thinking about how you want to run your uh, society. But whatever, like everyone has their things. Um, yeah, I think for me it's like I just try to take up less space. Honestly, um, I try to take up less space. Um, at the university kind of as a man, I try to um, 
make sure that I'm I'm giving the appropriate space, you know, in my my teaching in my reading list, um, you know, to authors from you know you know a, a number of um, gender backgrounds, right? Um, and I think that's especially the case because like as as the student population is changing, like faculty isn't quite keeping up with that. Um, and so I think it's it's more pressure on you, right? Like if if you notice that's changing in the student body and it may not be matched, you know, to the same degree in the faculty, then I think you have to be more more conscious about what you're presenting because that disconnect will really show like if you're if you're teaching from the perspective of who you thought was in those seats 30 years ago, um, and you have the students showing up now, like there, there's going to be a tension that you know I don't think is you know actually useful. It doesn't have to be there. But thank you. Yeah, I think no, we had I'm, some. I, I know exactly what you mean in terms of um, it's it's one thing when you look at demographics of the student body, but then you sort of look at where the centers of power are, both at a university and in our government and everywhere else. And, um, I'm not. I'm not trying to say there's a uh, an emergency of of, uh, of of males in college, but um, it is it is a it is a striking change to me as I as I watch um, just how things are how things are changing and kind of what the, this notion of what it what masculinity means now and what you know and, and moving forward with it. But I think Makisha is going to um, take over with some questions that are coming in from the audience. Thank you so much. So right now there are two questions. And the first one, I think for now, I'll just go in order. The first question that Lena is asking, how long does it typically take to write a full poem start to finish? Yeah, I'm, I'm writing way slower um, than I used to. And I'm absolutely fine with that. Um, like letting a poem live in my head for a while, letting it live on the page in different, you know, ways for a while. Cause like even, even that poem that I read a fragment of, you know, part of me like yesterday was like, oh, let me try to like finish this. And then I was like, mm, you know, I don't think that's what the process is asking for. Like it can live as it lives right now, but you know, you'll finish it as you have more time to like work out, like what is this feeling that you're trying to figure out, you know, between, you know, you and your mother. Um, so as before, like when I was younger, when I was at, you know, UVA, I was like rattling off poems, like, you know, every other day, every day. Um, but now I'm like, I'd, I'd rather, I'd rather write a poem that at least had time to like, be suspicious of myself, right? Because I mean, we all love that feeling of like creating something new. Um, but I think nowadays, it's more important for me to like stop and think about, you know, are you doing enough? Like, are you doing enough, like relative to what you're capable of at this point? And that's not even really about craft. Like most of the craft stuff happens fairly easily. I'm thinking about like, uh, you know, per perspective politics, like how much of myself um, am I implicating and like getting on the page, like those kind of things. Like I also know, like in some ways, particularly with my imagery, like how am I making sure like I'm not being ableist about certain things? So that's one of my blind spots I know um, is ableism. So now I, I take more more time with it and I'm happy to do that. And the thing about that is, is like, like why I still write, I love that feeling of getting to the end of that process. And then like the first thing I think of is like, man, I remember when I didn't think I could finish this poem. Like I remember when I didn't think I could finish this poem and it's done, right? Um, and so like, what does that mean? That you can maybe do it again. And so that that feeling is the thing, like, you know, the whole like, what is it? Um, the Godfather, you know, every time I try to get out, they keep pulling me back in. It's that feeling, you know, that keeps pulling me back into this, this process. So thank you for the, for the question. Thank you so much for that, for that response. Um, Lucas is asking, what are your thoughts about sections in a manuscript versus no sections? And I, and I think slash ordering poems in a collection. So thoughts about sections and thoughts about ordering. I hope I'm honoring the question. Yeah. Um, hey, Lucas. Uh, I think you should always try one time um, to get through the manuscript without sections. I forget who I was talking about uh, this with today. I think it's maybe Jetty, but I was, I was talking about how, you know, when you're working with a book, um, you're really sort of managing conversations, like conversations between poems. 
And I think you want to figure out, <clears throat> it's like, you know, you can you can be the kind of party host that shows up and like, okay, you four in this room, you four in this room, you four in this room. Or you can be the kind of host that says, hmm, like, let me just kind of like put different people next to each other and just kind of like see how this conversation evolves throughout this larger space, right? Um, so I think you should just try that once just to see what you're working with. And then once you get a sense of that energy, you can kind of step back and say, okay, like, I like what was, I like this conversation that was happening over here. Like, I'm going to give them this space. Like, I like this conversation. I'm going to give them this space or this, this conversation, even if it's small, like it needs some separation from these larger conversations. So I'm, I'm not like anti-sections. I think definitely like mistrust, like the three section format, like, oh, there's a, you know, but like, no, don't do that. Um, but you know, try it first to see how far you can get without and then come in and say, all right, how do I need to manage these, these different conversations? But I'm not an expert. Thank you. So our next question is from Miriela, wondering what advice do you have for beginning slash younger poets? Um, don't just write poetry, um, because if you if you have a, a particular lyric eye or lyric talent, um, I think that's something that we can see now in more of the work that's being published. That's intentionally sort of cross genre, like that people want that. Um, that you can bring that to other formats. So like write poetry for sure um, and read widely. You know, don't be don't be too invested in, you know, necessarily like having, I say, a way or a style too early. Like you may have one, but I think, you know, what you realize like style is adaptive. Um, you know, there's, um, you know, I often talk about in, in my workshops, there's this uh, great swordsman, uh, Miyamoto Musashi, and he, you know, talks about the two sword style, and, uh, and the thing about that is, like, you have, you know, your strong sword, which is the things that you know you do well, sort of your strength, and then you have sort of, like, your, the things that you're sort of, like, working on, but you can also use your weaker sword, and the thing is, like, if, if you're only fighting with this, it's like you're fighting with one hand tied behind your back, right, so I think you always want to be thinking about the ways in which you can incorporate those things that you know you may not be as strong with um but that can be also be useful in that sort of combat of like trying to penetrate um you know trying to stab you know a, a reader which is often like the way i think about poetry like i think every reader for for one of my poems is like waiting on the other side like this um and so like i'm trying to find a way to say okay i know whatever thoughts you have about poetry or whatever thoughts you may have about whatever you know kind of poem this is but i'm going to find a way to get through that and sort of like to pierce you in a way that kind of opens you up. Um, so that's what I'm always trying. I just can't do that with like one tool all the time. Um, so I would say sort of like to keep, keep that mix uh, fresh. Okay, I'll keep them coming. And if we get a chance, I'll slip my own question in, but not after honoring what's already here. So Rachel's asking, and I appreciate the parts I notice a vulnerability in your poems that I haven't seen before, and I've read your poetry. I appreciate this. Do you see this yourself? Also, do you think we'll have a post-pandemic burst of creativity? A PS, I mean like a renaissance if we don't dissolve into an apocalypse. Um, hmm. Well, I, I mean, I'll say it's the last part. Um, and I, I don't want to invalidate the feelings of the generations of those beneath me, um, because I know what they feel in relationship to the way things are going to the with the environment is very real. Um, you know, I, I did some time sort of in uh, Eastern China and I saw things there environmentally that I've never seen here that definitely, you know, shaped, uh, you know, my, my, my vision for the outlook, you know, on humanity, but, but, I will say, I think there is, you know, something a little arrogant about the way we think about the apocalypse. Like, like you, you have to remember like how, like if you're looking at all of like earth history, like humanity is such a small part of it. Like, I think the earth could easily be done with us and like go on and live 
another you know set of you know millions of years or like how long it's going to take until the sun sort of expands and consumes the earth right um so I, I guess that's to say like yes there is going to be life on the other side of this like we are going to to you know to make things like and yes there's something precious about it um but i i don't think it's it's like it's it's going to be rough in its ways um but I, I don't think it would be particularly unique compared to other moments of history when you know humanity has kind of come back from chaos. It'll just be what it looks like right now, right? Um, I I more think about the, the, the decline in the birth rate um, and what that's going to do to us. That's the thing I, I think about. Um, and like some of those things may be you know positive, some of those things may be, but you know that's the thing I think you know was really gonna and like we see that like now with the pandemic. I mean. You know we're dying and we forget that like like it was like two thousand people still dying a day um and, and that's just you know here um so there's that uh to the to the vulnerability um i think you know i think uh there's always been something like i wouldn't call like i wouldn't like i feel weird calling it that myself if that makes sense like i wouldn't like <laughs> like i would never say like oh i'm vulnerable like in my poems like i I mean, if there's things that are sort of open, I am trying to open to different things. I am trying to sort of see um, how I relate to masculinity from um, different perspectives. And also just really the, 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 the impact of not thinking about it. That's, that's the thing that's more important to me. It's like, when I look at the world and like so many things, like the economy, the environment, COVID, all of this shit, I, I, I just see it's so much of it is like men being afraid you know, that they're not going to have the power, the influence that they used to, and they make these fucked up decisions just to try to hold on to some power, right? And it's like, if you if you could just kind of like step back and realize that you could live in a world where you didn't have to dictate everything and be okay, like, you know, the, I think we get better. And everyone says like, oh, well, you, you know, there would still be problems like if there's a world run, run by women. Not my point. <laughs> not even what I'm talking about. <laughs> like, like yes, that's true. But deal with the deal with your part. Your part right now is that you're you're not being introspective in any way. So just deal with that. Like when we get to the world that's run by women, like then then raise your hand. But like it, it, we're not there yet. So just deal with you right now. Um. So that's that's just what I'm trying to do. And I I know I know Rachel. Uh. So um. It's good to. Good to hear. Is that it? You know, you had a question, Makesha. Yes, you. you well, do, you I had a question, but I there's one more question in the chat, and do we have time for a few more questions? I mean, I'm good, but I know people have things to do. Got to eat. Right. Well, I'll at least ask this one question in the chat, and if we don't get to my questions, that's totally okay. Um, the question we have in the chat is, is there anything specific that helps you if you're ever experiencing writer's block? Oh, I don't believe in writer's block. Um, and that's, that's not a way to dodge the question. That's, it's, it's just the fact that I look at everything as being seasonal, right? So right now we are in, you know, the harvest season. We go in the winter when, you know, um, the fields go fallow in a necessary way. Like if, if you farm a field every season, you take all the nutrients out the soil, right? And then you start growing cr uh, crap crops. So for me, if I'm in a place where I'm not writing, as long as I know if I'm feeding that soil in other ways, like I'm good. Like I, I know it's like, it's okay. Like you don't need to be farming in this, this, this plot of land all the time. And also too, right? The, the time away from the field allows you to think like maybe I'll, I'll, I'll grow something different here next time. Like, you know, maybe I won't grow the same things that I was growing before. So I think you should always look at writer's block as an opportunity, like one, to recharge and two, sort of make different decisions. Now I'll say, I think, I, th I think here's the, the thing that we don't like, so there's writer's block, what we think of normally, let's get rid of that. And let's talk about writing avoidance, right? So I think that is a thing. Like, I think there, there are things when you're like, hmm, there's this subject that I know I should be writing about but I don't feel like I have the confidence to do that just yet, right? Um, I think that's a real thing. And it's one, you can sort of look at other people who are writing about it. It's sort of a way of kind of gaining some confidence and sense of like how you might navigate it. Um, but I think at some point, 
you just have to accept that as a draft, right? And a draft is something that only you can see. As a draft, you can never do something so wrong that your creative world is gonna end. Like as a as a draft, right? Maybe you shouldn't publish that, you know, first draft too, but as a draft, you can always do something and it's not going to be the end of the world, right? Um, and I think sometimes we get so invested in an idea that we're like, oh, like I have to, it has to come out perfectly the first time. And not at all, you don't have to show that to anyone. Like I always say, you should have two notebooks, like one that's just for you and one that's sort of as a go-between space between your creative world and, and the public world, right? Um, and you should use that personal notebook. It's like, you know, this is just for me. Um, and burn it like before you die or like your best friend just like leave a note like saying hey you got to burn that other notebook because if that ever gets published sort of as my juvenilia i'm going to come back and haunt the fuck out of you so just just make a deal that you you had to make sure like someone isn't you know gonna access that um because i hate that i hate that like when i see writers juvenilia published i'm like that's that you you need to protect people's creative space like you know no one no one asks or respect this stuff I remember once like my grandmother used to, th she didn't think it was a threat, but it was. She would say, oh, I have all your like writing from when you were like 13, 14. And I'm like, oh, please grandma, like don't, <laughs> like, I don't wanna have to have this conversation with you. So yeah, um, don't worry about writer's block. If it had writer's avoidance, you know, talk to someone, sort of read some things and it'll be all right. Thank you so much. I'm wondering if this is where we pause and close. Do we have time for one more question or? I think that's yeah. for you, Chad. <clears throat> yeah, why don't we have one more, one more, one more. Wrap things up, that would be great. Okay, great. Well. I will go ahead and ask my question. I feel like I really schemed on that one. Um, how we know that you are an educator and have been for a long time. And I think my question is about, is like in the spirit of mutual, yeah, just mutual learning. And so I'm curious about like what you wanna offer most to your students these days and what you feel like your students are teaching you. Um, for me, the most important thing that I've been trying to offer uh, my students over the last uh, couple semesters is really um, kindness. Like, I think that's the thing, like the pandemic is stressing us out in so many ways, like nothing, nothing burns me more than hearing about another faculty member being in you know, like rigor is still real and I'm not, I'm not against rigor, um, but being an unnecessary hard ass, like particularly during these times when like, you just don't know what people are dealing with. You don't know what this pandemic has been like for different people. Um, so for me, it's one kindness and two space. Like generally I'm, I don't like automatic writing. I don't like being asked to write in person. Um, and therefore like, I don't really do it that much in class, but you know, one of the things that I realized you know, of latest, like, especially like in the beginning of the pandemic, like if I wasn't giving my students time to write in class, like they weren't going to do it. There was just too much static in other places, right? So to really make the creative writing class creative and like treat it more like a studio sometimes than anything, um, that's what I felt was most important, like right now, that just I do whatever I can to help you maintain your relationship to your creativity. Um, in your activity, you'll you'll get to a point, you know, when you're you're back to producing your material at a clip when you can start thinking about refinement, right? But right now, we just need to keep the pilot light lit, um, because I know I'm just seeing lots of people just sort of falling away uh, from the craft because there's so much else going on, and I understand that. So, like anything I can do to just kind of help keep that flame on right now, like that's that's my focus. Well, I would just say, at least for me, I think coming to um, readings and hearing other people's work is one of the things that keeps the flame on in a weird way. Weird way. I've never been to a reading where I didn't come away with some ideas. And so I just want to thank you for, uh, for your time, Kyle, and um, for meeting with the students and um, just everything else. 
Um, so with that, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up uh, unless you guys have anything else that you wanted to add at the end here. Uh, no, just a, a thank you. And again, it was a pleasure to sort of meet with all the students and see the work, you know, very impressive and overwhelming. And I'm just thankful for the space. I'm glad things are going relatively well down there and like, you know, I'll make it back at, at, at some point <laughs> once, once this is settled into a more endemic phase. Yeah, yeah, I think we're all we're all looking for that. The UVA numbers are pretty good right now, but it's still a scary time for everybody. So I appreciate the ways that you're trying to address for that, the space you're trying to give people. But I think with that, we'll go ahead and sign off for the night. So thank you so much, Carl. Thank you.